First off, welcome everyone. Uh, I was like all of you, you know, playing tennis from a really young age. When did most of you guys start? Who started before they were five? Ben. <laughs> Who started between five and ten? Who started after ten? Okay, good, good, good to know. So. Really, what we want to chat about today is, you know, my, my background's pretty diverse. Uh, you know, started as a player like all of you, uh, played professionally for a short period, and then sort of got injured, had shoulder problems. And that's what got me into all of this whole area of understanding the body and understanding sports science. So really, I've worked with tennis for most of my career. Worked with the USTA with their play development program for five years down in Florida. So every top American player that you've seen on TV, I've worked with. Uh, it was really a fortunate opportunity. Uh, so Jack Sock, Madison Keys, Sloan Stevens, John Isner, um, Ryan Harrison, you know, who, who, you know, the entire group of them. So I've known all of them since they were 10, 11, 12 years old. So they've gone through the process. Uh, all of them were really good from a pretty young age. Uh, but it's one of the things that relates that you can take into what you do is there's certain things that great players really focus on uh, and it's a really really important concepts to remember from the standpoint of understanding that the little details do really matter and most of the time the difference at your level is you know how well you practice how consistently you practice how you listen to your coaches and how you make those improvements so it's one of those things that you have to really ensure that you're taking your time listening to the right people and then implementing it so whether it's in tennis whether it's in school whatever it is there's the difference between the one percenters, the people that do mostly everything right, and then everyone else. And you gotta ask yourself, what group do you wanna be in? You don't have to be the greatest tennis player in the world, but you have to really dedicate yourself to being the best you can be, so from an improvement standpoint. From my background, with, you know, I worked in tennis a lot, but also worked with the Gatorade Sports Science Institute, so I directed that. Most of you probably don't even know what that is, but it's part of the Gatorade company. Uh, and we work with the professional athletes at Gatorade supports. So Ken Newton, Von Miller, Peyton and Eli Manning, uh, Abby Wambach. Uh, so a series of different athletes at that level. Uh, and they're the best in the world at what they do. I mean, the top, top 0.001%. And their mindset and the way they approach the, the details is very, very impressive. And from a standpoint of looking for the extra edge. Any of you guys play golf? Maybe a little bit. If, a, if you follow golf, the number one golfer in the world right now is Dustin Johnson. And he was a guy that really always had trouble sort of finishing the job. <clears throat> kind of like in tennis. He'd always have the strokes, he'd always have the ability, but he'd never be able to get over the line. <coughs> is there a pro right now that you can think of in tennis that probably is like that? And you would say, hey, they're good enough to win multiple Grand Slams, but they haven't done it. Male or female, anyone you can think of? Curious. Okay, so Nick Curious, you know, he's got great ability. He hasn't been able to put it together yet. Uh, is there a chance that he will? Is it probably a pretty good chance that he will, if he if he gets the right you know, mentorship and the right advice. From a Dustin Johnson standpoint, he's gone through. If you don't know him, I mean, his story is pretty interesting. Great golfer, um, you know, partied a lot. It's all public knowledge. He, you know, he got himself in trouble doing things he shouldn't be doing, which a lot of people do. But you know, he then got in with, he's actually gonna be marrying Wayne Gretzky, who's a hockey player. Some of you guys probably don't know who Wayne Gretzky is either. But in general, he's the best hockey player ever. Uh, and so he's marrying uh, his daughter. And there was an article recently that they were talking about what was the biggest piece of advice that he gave um, to Dustin to get him to sort of get over that hump. And the, the number one thing he said, he said, if you wanna be the best, you have to pay the price. Uh, do you know what he means by that? Work. Yeah, you've got to do things that other people won't do. I mean, to be the best at anything, you have to do things better than everyone else. And you don't just wake up one day and that happens. Uh, you know, you get to a certain level with ability. Uh, you know, ability can get you pretty far, but you have to put the day-to-day -day work. And that's a really, really important concept. And that really hit home, changed a lot of things about the process of what they were trying to accomplish from the training, to the nutrition, to the sleep, to the scheduling. All those factors at a professional level is super important. At your level, it's more about
focusing on your daily practice plan. What are you trying to work on when you step on the court today? Do you have two or three things that you know, this is why I'm gonna work on, what I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna improve on? If you don't, that's an opportunity right there. And if you just go on the court and you start hitting balls and not having a clear plan, you're not practicing to your true potential. So that's one aspect. The other is, you know, physical training. What are you guys doing? Typically at your level, the person that moves the best wins most of the matches. That's a big component of tennis. Being physically dominating, using your speed, using your power is really, really important. You can be strong, you can be quick. You know, most, you know, the top players are both. They're strong and quick. Many at your level, you're either strong or quick. If you can get a bit better at both of those, it's really going to make a huge difference in what you do. So understand that piece of it. Then the little details, how do you prepare for your matches? You know, do you have a routine that you go through before you go play? Or do you sort of just you know, get off the bus and go play? You know, what do you do with nutrition? Do you even think about that? You know, those are the questions you've got to ask yourself. What are those 1% things you can potentially do that can make a little bit of a difference in your existence and what you're trying to do on court? You were talking about getting more protein. What specifically can people do to get more protein? Okay, so you know the main protein sources? Are you familiar with them? Uh, shakes. Yeah, so protein powder, but it's the shakes is an easy one. You can easily use that in a lot of ways. And it's great, it's very easy, it's relatively cost effective. Chocolate milk is a really good one. So again, chocolate milk has a little high sugar content. But the reason being is because after workouts, you probably usually recommend that because it's one of the cheapest sources. So, you know, it's, the, it's cheaper than most protein powders. But you can take that after a workout. Uh, you just don't necessarily want to drink four or five chocolate milks throughout the day. We recommend sort of chocolate milk after your workout, or once a day, maybe twice a day if you work out twice. Uh, but then all your main um, your meat and fish sources are great. So whether chicken, turkey, if you want red meat, you've got your red meats. Uh, you bought any fish is really good. It varies in protein content, but in general, any fish is pretty good for you. Uh, then you've also got certain types of beans and legumes. If you're anyone vegetarian here, there's you know there's quite a few vegetarians, and you can still get a really good protein diet if you're a vegetarian. That you just get them from different sources. There's other forms of protein. Right? There's rice protein. There's pea protein. Uh, so there's you know vegetarian sources of protein outside of meat. So those are your main, main sources. But you know, there's plenty of bars and shakes which are easy. Yeah, because you can travel with them and they make your life a little easier. But there's a lot of natural food sources which you can get them from as well. So any thoughts from your standpoint? Was there a specific? Uh, no, I, just, I was just wondering if you can eat you know, shakers and like day or two. Just yeah, so if you have meat, if you're in meat, fish, you know, with, with a shake, I mean, you know, with the pro athletes that we work with, they're having at least one shake a day. Many of them are having three shakes a day. So they're having shakes, they're, they're having four, usually four good meals a day, plus two, three shakes a day. So, you know, they're eating, you know, a breakfast, a mid-morning lunch, then they practice again, and then they have a, a lunch at about two, three, you know, then they'll have another workout, then they'll have a shake after that, then they'll go shower, they'll get treatment, then they'll come and have a full-size dinner, uh, and then they'll do stretching, something like that at night, and then they'll have a shake before they go to bed, a different type of shake, where they'll have protein in there. So they're, depending, guys are consuming anywhere from four to 7,000 calories a day. You know, but they're also training 30 to 40 hours a week, physically. So training on court 20 plus hours, and they're training physically another 10 to 15 hours, depending on who they are. Yeah. And a lot of that stretching, mobility, flexibility work, not necessarily sweating completely and the heart rate up through the roof, but they're putting time in getting their body better, which takes energy. So most of you aren't training at that volume, I understand that, but you pair it down to that level. Also, your metabolisms are much faster uh, right now in your time period. So you have the luxury, most of you, to really consume a lot of good quality food. We're not saying eat a lot of fried food and a lot of your simple sugars, but you want to make sure you're healthy and you eat a lot of good calories. And it's pretty hard to overdo the calories if you get them from good sources. Makes sense? Yeah.
Yeah, no, perfect question. So the sports drinks or the simple sugars, the goos, the jelly beans, things like that, have a real place for athletes that are training hard, but it's only during pretty much what we call the point of sweat, so when you're exercising. Because when you're exercising, it's pulling straight from that simple sugars that are available at the time, and you want it available. Your performance improves with carbohydrates in your system when you're exercising. The problem is a lot of people will do all this stuff when they're sitting on the couch or when they're in the middle of the day, and that's never what any of those are designed for. So you want to stay away from sugars throughout the day, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, stuff like that. We don't want sugars in those environments uh, or even snacks throughout the day. But during exercise, the sports drinks or foods or gels or things like that can really be helpful. So it's about timing issue. It's like a lot of things. It's never really a terrible food or a great food. It's about when you should do it. For example, protein is great for you for recovery. It's really bad for you just before you walk out on court because it doesn't get digested quickly. So it sits and it makes you feel uncomfortable. So you don't want to have like a big steak 30 minutes before you walk on the tennis court. That's not the best pre-match meal. But having a steak at night after a good ma after a long match is not a bad meal. So you've got to understand sort of where you're at. And then also food choices that you, you have you know, in your families. Some people avoid certain foods. Certain cultures do and don't eat different foods. And that's all fine. You know, I work with athletes that have so many dietary restrictions. Some are justified, meaning that it helps in some form or fashion. Others do it because it's cultural or religious reasons. Others do it because they saw someone else do it and they thought they'd try it. You know, there's a lot of reasons why people pick and choose diets and food studies. The biggest thing is you want to not necessarily cut out the food groups necessarily. That's usually not a great strategy. You want to make sure we moderate and we work within a framework of what you can do for the long term. Most of the time when you cut out certain food groups, it's hard for most people to maintain that for a long period of time. So really, really good question. Is there a question over here? Huh? How long have I been doing tennis? So I've been doing tennis since I was probably two years old. So I was playing tennis from a really, really young age. From like working with tennis players professionally, like from a standpoint where I actually knew enough that I could help someone, probably 15 years. So that's kind of yeah the, the time frame. But I, I've been playing tennis from, you know, I was... My dad played a little bit, so I'd be running around the courts and picking up balls and doing that. So from a standpoint of being able to actually know enough to help someone, probably 15 years. I know you have a whole class we can do on this, but could you go over the basics of the serve? Yeah. We have a lot of guys here. Everyone could use help. It's not a lot. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So the serve is simple. You guys should all serve rockets. That's goal number one, okay? There's no reason you can't serve them. Okay? Because you gotta simplify life. There's a couple things you gotta get right. You gotta get your toss right. Yeah. Goal number one. The toss is in the right spot consistently, it makes your whole life a lot easier. There's a couple of simple things to think about with your toss. One is your arm position. Many of you release the ball too straight on like this. If you're right-handed, you want to release that way. So think about the net post, release the arm in line with the net post. That's goal number one. The reason being is if you release there, you can turn your hips. Me, so if you think about basic physics principles, for every action, we have an equal and opposite reaction. You heard of that? Who said that? <laughs> okay, someone was paying attention to physics. Okay, so simple, simple concept. If we want our body weight to go that way into the court, which you've all been told, get your body going in the direction you want to hit the ball, we have to score it in the opposite direction, correct? It's a concept we all agree on. So for us to go this way, we first have to push energy back that way. So that's your goal number two. If you're crossing the right spot, then we have to store our energy that way. So this way, so that we can release it that way. So most people don't do that very well. Most people say, hey, I'm doing a knee bend, so they go straight down. If you go straight down, your energy can only go straight up, 
and then for you to make contact with the ball, you have to turn your hips and shoulders early and collapse. It's probably a lot of you do. So when you're working on your serve later today or tomorrow, whatever it is, think about release point, think about turning hips back and down, and that's a main, main part of the serve. If you get those two pieces, then everything else becomes worth working on. If you don't get those two pieces, anything you do with contacts is somewhat irrelevant at this point because you don't have the right you know, summation of forces as well. We want to get forces from the ground up through the body and out into the floor. But we need to take care of your toss and we need to take care of destroying of your energy in the right direction. Do those two concepts make sense? You be very clear on what we're talking about. So that's what we work on. And then once you get that really, really good, then we can worry about what's happening at contact. Because at contact is what's the difference between a good serve and a great serve. It's can you hit the wide serve, the T serve, the flat serve? Can you hit a really good kick serve? Do you have the ability to do all those things? And you know, there's only about a four degree difference in racket. So if you've got a racket, someone's got a racket here. So if you've got a racket here, a flat serve, you know, is, is like this, pretty much. A slice serve is like that. That's the only difference. It's not, you don't make contact like this. If you make contact like this, the ball would literally go in the side fence. So we only have approximately a four degree difference between a flat serve and a slice serve. So there's not a lot of difference up here. That's not where we make the majority of the serve from. The majority of the serve comes from the lower body, up through the shoulder and into the serve. So you want to get those basics down really, really well and then worry about what we're doing at contact and things like that. And the good thing is all of you have all of you have the ability to have really good serves. Just got to understand what we're doing right. One of the things I also see a lot at your level is for a right hand that is back foot, when you bring it up, comes around too much. So if your back foot comes around like this, that causes you to then open up your hips. And if you open up your hips, we get into this problem where we get to the here and then we have to collapse to make contact. So in general, we want to keep our back foot behind our front foot. If you bring, if you bring your feet up. Does that make some sense? Do you even know if you bring your foot up, if you bring your foot around? Anyone aware of if they do or don't? <laughs> yeah, you do it? All the time. Yeah. Have you been told that before? All the time, yeah. So when did you fix it? I fixed it one summer, and then I stopped playing for a while. And then I got back into the habit, but like I've been trying to fix it ever okay. since. So you understand, all shoes were built for tennis players. Do you realize that? Because you see here, we have an arch in the shoe there. You see how it curves in? It's designed, whether it's your runners or tennis shoes or golf shoes, whatever it is, it's designed for tennis players. Which is anyone that brings their foot up, it's perfectly designed for your back foot to slide in to your front foot. You see that? Back foot slides into the front foot. Does that make sense? So there's no reason ever that your back foot should come around the front foot. It's designed for you to push your foot in there. So they never even realized that when they were making running shoes that they were actually making tennis shoes. Because we need to utilize the shoe the way it's designed and take advantage of that design aspect. So you understand what we're saying? There's a clear position there where the back foot can actually get pushed into so you can't do it wrong. It's tennis serving for dummies is how our shoes are designed. We really can't screw it up if you use what's there. So next time you surf, can you try that? Mm -hmm. Let me know how it goes. Okay. Any other uh, thoughts? Yeah, so the grip, again, you, you, you've you all got you know, coaches that work with you. Listen to them. The grip on the serve, there's a little variability, but there's not a lot of variability. Somewhere close to continental. Everyone knows what a continental grip is, kind of, like the V on top. Okay, so start there. Pros can shift a little left or right, depending on if they're going to hit a first serve or second serve. Some of them go a little more one way or the other. But in general, you have a pretty narrow range of where your grip is. We don't want to see an extreme forehand grip on the serve, okay, which some of you, I'm guessing, probably do. Yeah, we want to have a more grip closer to continental. Does that make sense? 
food because you know it gives you options. That's the problem. If you go full, you know, frying pan grip, which I'm sure a few of you may, if you go full frying pan grip like this, that only gives you one option, and that's to do that. You can't do that really very well. So that's why you want to be somewhere more so on a continental type grip. You can have a little variation here or there, but not not a huge amount. Make some sense. I'm guessing that uh, most of these players are, um, you know, entering their school seasons, whether it's junior high or high school, or you know, kind of ramping up in the spring season, getting ready to go to this qualifying, getting ready for for some big tournaments this summer. Um, what would you say would be just some general focus points as far as training? you know, focuses for their, their periodization now getting into a competitive phase. So, so you guys are getting ready to play a lot of matches, the weather will swarm them out, things like that. So you're going to take care of your body, number one, because, you know, how many of you have pains or anything that bothers you over the last six months? Anyone? A couple of people? Okay, so, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why, but the question is, you have to do the preventative work. Little basics, 10 minutes a day here or there, you know, work on taking care of, especially your ankles. Most so of you are, are, have unstable ankles because you're growing so much. You want to strengthen your ankles as best you can. If the ankles are weak, everything up the chain has to do more work to stabilize, and it becomes harder and put a lot more strain on the rest of your body. So make sure you do a couple of ankle exercises, real simple things. Uh, make sure we work on our hips. Hips are vital. That's the real link between the lower body and the upper body. And if that's weak, we can't load on our outside leg on wide balls. We can't push off effectively on the serve. We can't change directions well. So hips are really, really important. Then core strength, of course. If you guys can't do two minutes of planks with good technique, you're not an athlete, simply good. Uh, so you've got to find a way to get two minutes on a plank. And if I was to say everyone do two minutes of planks now with good technique, you can do it. Yeah. Some good, some good. The ones that think they could probably don't have good technique and the ones that can't, you've got stuff to work on. So you both have stuff to work on. Okay, so very, very simple stuff. We've got to be at that level. I mean, you guys are competitive athletes. That's what you do. You know, we've got to embrace that mindset of you've got to take care of the body. Uh, and then from a tennis standpoint, a lot of stuff on the shoulder because we don't want to get shoulder and elbow problems. So basic band work, things like that. Real simple. All that should take no more than 10 minutes a day. But if you can do 10 minutes a day of the right things to take care of those little things from the body, that's going to help you tremendously during the season especially. And then then you ramp up when you get a little more time in the off season, in the summer maybe, uh, after the tournaments are done, to really start loading up more on the weight side of things. Because many of you are getting to that stage where it's really going to help you. If you can get really strong and really stable, the strong is one thing, that's how much weight can you lift. You know, getting really strong by itself is half of it. Being real stable when you lift heavy is really important. And there's a lot of athletes that can lift a lot of weight that aren't stable, and that's problematic as well, because then you're putting a lot of heavy resistance on an unstable frame, and something breaks down. So we want to make sure if you go lift heavy, which is good, it's important to be really good at, at any athletic movement, you have to be strong, but you have to be stable at the same time. Uh, make sure that you get the stability piece of all of that through through your programming. And then, you know, make sure that you go into these matches willing to compete. Because the whole point of competition is to compete and to figure out where you're at today and what you need to work on the mark. Now, winning and losing is secondary. The process is what's important. But going out there, competing as hard as you can, playing a strategy that you agree with with your coaches and what's going to give you the best chance of success, and then figuring out ways to execute when it matters. The execution is always hard. Everyone knows what they should be trying to do, and hopefully they know what they should be trying to do. Getting the execution requires you to put the practice in daily. You don't get a lot better if you don't practice. You know, it doesn't just happen. So you have to time your practice in the right way to ensure that you really, really improve from that perspective. Hey, no, it's been a, a lot of fun for me to you know, catch up, speak with you. Well, we, do we have matches coming up pretty soon? Yeah. yeah. When, when's the next match? 
Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah. Awesome. Are you guys ready? I'm ready. Is the match ready for us? We might have look at it. I think the match is ready. It's scheduled. <laughs> so it's about whether you bring it. Um, with the Blue Gray coming, I want everyone to, of course, go watch the Blue Gray tomorrow after school and all day Saturday. What are some things they can look for in the Great, great question. So you're going to see some of the best players in the country at the collegiate level, men and women. So you've got to understand that they played all their life to be at this point. I mean, it's taken a long 10 plus years many of them to get to where they're at. But watch what they do on court from the standpoint of how they move in and out of corners with wide balls, how quickly they recover. So when they get a short ball, Notice the ones that take advantage of the short ball and play aggressive. Notice the ones that sort of loop with that, and that's the strategy known as hope. They're hoping their opponent is going to miss. That's it. That's all they're doing. They get the opportunity to be forceful. They're all good enough to be forceful on the short ball. Many of them don't have the will or all the confidence to hit that. And that's a big separating factor. You don't see a number one, two, or three on a big team not take advantage of that short ball. You see a lot of five sixes on most teams not to take advantage of that short ball. That's the biggest difference at the level. Because a number one in college and a number six on a good team, there's not that much difference in the level. But there are certain things that you can notice. It's not necessarily how hard they hit, it's not necessarily even how well they move. It's about do they take advantage of those three, four, five opportunities in the back that they're given that impose their will on their opponent. give up that option and hand it over to their opponent who then takes the advantage. So at the higher levels, you've got to be aggressive. You've got to know how to play defense, but you've got to know how to be aggressive under control on big points. At the level you're at, being too aggressive is a weak. You make too many errors. We can't live a life making errors. But you've got to understand that we have to take advantage when the opportunity's there. Just give yourself really big targets, meaning that Hit three feet inside the baseline. Hit three feet inside the sideline. Give yourself really, really big targets that if you spray it, if you get nervous, you're still not going to miss. Because the worst thing you can do is miss short balls. You know, that frustrates you more than it frustrates anyone else. Because you say, hey, I played a good point, I got the ball I wanted, and then I missed. And then it, then it stops you mentally maybe the next time playing the right way. So really, really important to go into those matches with a clear plan. Know your game plan, first off. If I was to ask every one of you, what's your game plan A? Are you trying to hit backhand cross courts to open up a short forehand? Are you looking to hit three inside out forehands to control the court with your forehand? Are you looking at a certain role? What's your strategy? If you don't clearly know how you're trying to play, then you're leaving a lot on the table. Because then you're just going out there and you're hitting if you, you, you're not a true match competitor without understanding the strategy. You may compete well, you may run all day, you may just put balls in and hope your opponent misses, but over the long run, you're not going to win as many matches unless you have a clearly defined game plan A. How am I going to win? What's my best game plan? Because most of the time, you don't know your opponents that well. So you're not scouting that significantly. So you're not really trying to figure out, okay, I want to fly short to that person's forehand, so they pop up a ball that I can then you know, dictate on because I know their short forehand weak. Or, hey, I know their second serve to the backhand is not a strength there, so I'm going to run around my backhand a lot and crush big forehands. If you know that, great, but most of you don't. So what you do know is yourself. You know how to control your side of the court and play your game so you can be aggressive and you can do what gives you the best chance of winning. So it's all a strategy about giving you the best opportunity to win you know, and a lot of the time, strategy can help you do that. You gotta still execute, but you gotta execute either way. Some people execute with bad strategy and lose. If you execute with good strategy, you're more than likely to win.